Um, I'm Deborah Foster. I'm chair of the trustee and I'm chair of the uh, Visitor Experience and Education Committee and I want to first welcome all of you. I have a little spiel here today only because I messed up last week and I wasn't pleased with myself. Um, so today we have the privilege of welcoming Warren Kimball who will be our fifth speaker in a series of six that we're doing this year. And um, the Sheldon, as you know, has been sort of uh, the shepherd and the custodian of a number of items, probably over close to 100,000 different items. Um, we are one of the oldest community, continuously running community museums in the country, if not the oldest, which is a, a really wonderful thing to think that we have that precious nugget of history from our community members of 100 years or more ago. Mm -hmm. uh, today, uh, if you've attended one of our previous uh, lectures. You've heard me say that the idea for this particular Did You Know series came out of our education meetings where Warren shared with us that he'd been a cheerleader back in his days at Syracuse and we all turned to each other and said, did you know that? <laughs> and then at some other time, Bill or Mary or Eva said to us, well, we have George Washington's ventures, you know. <laughs> and we're like, did you know that? <laughs> so we're continually learning in our education committees the wealth and the breadth of the collection here at the Sheldon. But we also have learned that our individuals here in our community have not only a, a regional following and expertise, but they're also nationally recognized, and such as Warren. And uh, we have Amy Oxford, nationally travels. We had uh, Dr. Jim Douglas and Glenn Andres in our past uh, presentations. So with that, uh, we decided that a good series for all of us on education would be on Did You Know? And uh, Warren's going to share some of his insights on being a cheerleader for the arts for many decades and how he has brought communities together focused on the arts and what the arts can do for us as a community. So um, without any further ado, I'll let him explain uh, and share his insights. And I have uh, Bill, our executive director, Bill Brooks, will do the formal introduction of Warren. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. I really <coughs> want great gratitude to Deborah for organizing her committee. And included in the committee is uh, Sue Sears, who's here. She's a retired teacher up from Cornwall. And then helping out has been uh, Danielle Ruggio, who's back here. She works at the college in their archives, and she's the president of our board. And then Sylvia Gonzalez is here. She's a new uh, trustee. And we retired trustee, Marnie. What's my last name? Wood. <laughs> Wood. Marnie Wood, who hired me. And our retired trustee here is uh, Jack Watts. And then my associate, Mary Manley, is here, who's the associate director. She's been here uh, for 20 years. So it's nice. This is a community effort, volunteers and, uh, and staff. So, And it's my privilege to introduce uh, Warren who, uh, like many of you, probably already know much of his history, and uh, but he hails from New Jersey, uh, down on the shore. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to get prompted. You just Mark. called half my story. <laughs> well, are you going through your history? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'll exclude that <laughs> uh, from, from the introduction. But, uh, in case you don't know, he has been a, a, a philanthropist and his wife, and Lorraine, is a wonderful partner in the business that, that they've had. Uh, Brandon is, he's put Brandon on the map, and uh, I first met Warren when I came to Vermont to head the Vermont Folk Life Centers, and he was just leaving, it's 1997, he was just leaving as a trustee. I was privileged to work with him on the violin project for the Vermont uh, Orchestra, and you may remember that, in which uh, violins were purchased and the artists painted them. And at the auction at the day of the Vermont uh, Symphony Orchestra concert, he acted as the uh, MC, and his violin sold for more than any of the other. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done a wonderful job in promoting the arts. He's energetic, and despite his youth, uh, he's always on top 
and ready to uh, lead us forward. So it's my privilege to welcome uh, Warren Kimball. Thank you. Well, I didn't know there were going to be so many people here that I already know. And, and anyway, so this story could be short, but I'm going to give you the long version. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my life, which I'm actually looking for somebody to write a book about it. I decided that when you get to this age, uh, that that could be fun for the kids and anyway, anybody else wants to uh, hear about it. But anyway, um, my name is Warren Lawrence Kimball. Is that a long tag? <laughs> anyway, I was born in Belleville, New Jersey, actually Orange, New Jersey, and born and raised in Belleville, which is Passaic, Patterson, Montclair, and it's a blue collar town. Um, parents, uh, Lil Kimball, Lillian Kimball, and Warren Henry Kimball, I'm not the third, I'm only the the first of, of many Warrens, and this is the other Warren here, who's here today, a friend of mine. Um, and we, we lived on top of the hill, it was called Mor Mortgage Hill. Uh, we didn't have much money, parents went to the eighth grade, but they were wild, and they had fun. We had a player piano, and we play I learned to pump that thing when I was God knows how old. So we sang all the time. So I come from a fun situation. And, and that's sort of my thing in life. If it, if it isn't fun, don't do it. And I don't mean silly, but fun. Have fun with it. Um, as I said, family were, were not ultra educated, but I had a brother who was 11 years older than I and myself. And uh, for some reason, they gave him tap dance lessons in New York City. Uh, they always said my mother couldn't afford underwear, but she, <laughs> but she gave ten dollars a, a week dance lessons to my brother. We went through the Holland Tunnel every Saturday. I was scared to death of the Holland Tunnel. I panicked under the sea. But I watched him take dance lessons from some of the top named dance educators in, in the country. Um, and because of that, uh, in, uh, when he, he was in the Navy, and anyway, as I was growing up, and 11 years older than me, so you understand that time gap in there. Uh, he danced on Broadway with Ethel Merman. He uh, went in the Navy, uh, got out of the Navy. My mother said, what are you going to do now? He said, I don't know, he sold. Uh, fruits and vegetables at the Jersey Shore. She was plenty, pardon the expression, pissed off <laughs> because she had spent all this money that they didn't have a lot on those dance lessons. And of course, he, he was like a Dan Daly. He was unbelievable. Um, then, so he decided he'd open up a dance studio in the cellar of this little house we lived in, a six-room house. I thought the house was huge, but you know how that is. So, <laughs> To go back today, we lived in there. <laughs> and it, uh, the attic was my refuge because I could see the, uh, the Empire State Building from the window, the front window of it, which is really kind of fun. So my mother said, Well, why don't you open up the dance studio in the cellar? And the cellar was not as big as this room. And so he did, and in a, a year, he had 500 pupils. Wow. and moved downtown. Well, this was after he was on Broadway and all that kind of stuff and everything. So I lived through all that. So we had a player piano out in the house, as I said. And so we sang it all the time and had a, a great time. They were fun, wonderful people. I don't know too much about them. Isn't that interesting? You know, we don't know too much about our parents because as we get older and, and we just don't, didn't hear about in those days, we didn't ask those questions. But I do, one thing I do remember was that my mother and father liked to dance a lot. And they would all of a sudden break out and dance, I don't know why. And, but I found, remember one thing that they, they used to go to the Empire Burlesque in, in York, New Jersey. And of course the burlesque wasn't the crude thing that it is today. It was show business, all the famous comedians were there and everything. 
So they did routines in the kitchen, uh, burlesque routines. So you can imagine how funny that, that was and, and how it brought me to, to who I am and so forth. Um, so my brother opens a dance studio. I'm in elementary school. Uh, he he had it up, does another business downtown, gets a store, rents a store, and makes lots of money, uh, creates a record business, and, and teaches uh, dance teachers all over the country. An uh, unbelievable guy, fabulous. Too bad he was a raving alcoholic. That's the sad part. But then in the daytime, he was great. <laughs> really terrific. So, um, that, so I grew up in, in this kind of situation. They left me alone. I think I was a mistake, actually, because I was born in 1935, so it was after the Depression. And I think they were just loose and had me. <laughs> and, and, and didn't do what they did for him and to him. They pressured him, like the ice skaters get pressures today, or sports people and so forth. They left me alone. So I sat on the front porch and cut up newspapers and pasted things together and did that kind of stuff. We lived a block from the school, so I walked to school. I was always last to get picked on the playground because I got hit with a baseball bat and that's what my mother said, I, I was cross-eyed. I don't believe that. <laughs> but anyway, I started wearing glasses when I was about five, I guess. So uh, I go to high school in Belleville following in my brother's footsteps, who was a star 11 years ago. Every teacher, oh, you're Bob Kimball's brother, uh, son, brother, not son, brother. And um, that was kind of hard in the beginning, till one day the high school principal, who, whom I knew well and knew my brother, called me up on the stage during a pep rally and said, uh, Warren Kimball, and by the way, I was called Cookie since I was six months old. <laughs> how how did you like that? That tag. <laughs> My uh, brother, uh, when I was six months old, said, "Let's name him Cookie." <laughs> and I've been Cookie to this day. I still get Cookie calls all over the place. It doesn't bother me in the least. It's actually helped me in a sense. But anyway, so this principal said, Cookie Kimball's in the audience. His brother was a, a big dancer and everything, and I'm sitting there like, uh huh. <laughs> they called me up on the stage, and I started to dance, because I could dance, and cheerlead. And that really made me. It could have hurt me tremendously, but it really made me who I am today. It allowed me to be me, and his influence was really pretty good in a sense. So I go through high school, and by the way, we went to, oh, I have to forget my props here. <laughs> but, uh, this, this is a painting, this comes in, this was, I painted this maybe 15 years ago, but that's my, I discovered after I did it, that was the wallpaper on my bedroom as a kid, oh. the, the uh, sailboat. Yeah. I didn't realize it when I did it, but then I remembered that. <laughs> and then every year, we went to the Jersey Shore, and, and uh, every year I got a new sand pail. And it either got stepped on or rusted out or something in any year. I now have a collection of over 100 empty sand pails. So I'd love to show you, but I can't bring them here. Right? Yeah. Oh, I had some here, though, didn't yeah. I? Yeah, yes. I had some here when I had to show you. So that, that just mem how memories go into your artwork and so forth. Um, and, and then uh, when I was in high school, I worked on the uh, boardwalk at Seaside Heights, New Jersey, spinning wheels and, you know, gambling wheels and did all kinds of crazy things. So high school was a fabulous experience for me. I was a good student in elementary school. I was a terrible student in high school because I spent 99% of the time in the art room. And anyway. So one day, um, by the way, my mother passed away when I was 16. I was a sophomore in high school. And so there, now it's my father and I bat batting together, and we did really well. We did really well. Um, but one uh, time for graduation from high school, and a friend of mine said, you should go to college. I didn't know anything about college. My parents weren't college grads or anything. I 
remember my mother saying I should go, but she wasn't around to influence me. So um, I went to the high school guidance counselor, and he said, don't bother, because you don't have good grades. I was in the art room, right? So he said, don't bother. So I went to the principal, and he said, you apply and go ahead. So this friend of mine went to Syracuse, a uh, good friend, and he said, well, you should apply. So I applied to Syracuse and Bucknell. I never would have gotten into Bucknell, never. So I applied to Syracuse uh, July, July 2nd, I think which is kind of late. <laughs> didn't go to any colleges. <laughs> no, we didn't see any, like we drag our kids with grandchildren into colleges today, and, you know, introduce them and fill out the form and everything. I filled out a form. I didn't submit any um, uh, college awards. I never took those. I didn't uh, submit a, a portfolio. And uh, I was accepted on the 23rd of July. Is that amazing? I mean, <laughs> Syracuse still does that. Uh, I know lots of stories like that. But that made me too. You know, it's just amazing that they would accept me. But they accepted me because I was selling magazines at the high school and doing all the stuff at the high school, which I've still been doing. Anyway, it's called giving. So, uh, where am I? Uh, so I go to, to Syracuse. The funny thing is, I go to Syracuse with a zoot zoot on, because I'm from Belleville, New Jersey, you know, where we danced and we had all the rock and roll was starting and everything. And I had a keychain, which they wear today. Oh, I had a, a jacket down here and a one button roll suit. And I went to Syracuse <laughs> one week early. And, and uh, with this friend, because I didn't know anything about Syracuse or college or anything, just took me up there and he went early and I stayed in the fraternity house and they pinned me before they were even the first week, which was illegal and all. And so, <laughs> crazy stuff. Right? And then I went out and bought the khaki pants, the blue shirt, and the whole bit. And, and, and my father made me promise that because I was a cheerleader in the high school and doing all that stuff, that I wouldn't do anything but study. He didn't know anything about any of this stuff. But uh, he said, uh, you just, you need to study and don't be a teacher. That was the other thing he said. Don't, yeah. You don't make any money, don't be a teacher. <laughs> so anyway, so the first week I was there, uh, I was running for president of the class. The second, the second two weeks later, I was, went out for cheerleading. Anyway, so that was the beginning of my college career. I knew nothing. And uh, I really had a wonderful time in Syracuse. Unbelievable. Um, I was president of my class two years, junior and senior year. Uh, John F. Kennedy handed me my diploma because they handed it to the whole, they don't give everybody up on the stage, you know, at a big university. And so he said, have a good life. So I'm pleased about that. <laughs> So anyway, um, so I, I get out of college. Uh, well, I shouldn't say this, but I had one mistake was I got married graduation day, uh, which was stupid. Anyway. <laughs> we did that. You know, in, in life, in, in my era, you you uh, you learned how to smoke. You you learned you got your driver's license, and you thought you were going to have sex. And we told about it a whole lot. <laughs> so after college, I, I, I had joined the Naval Reserve when I was in high school because my brother had been in the Navy and a friend of mine was in there, joined the Naval Reserve. And when, when I got at, and out, of the, uh, out of college, it was, uh, there was a draft still on, and I got drafted in the Army. Oh. Stupid me, I didn't know I was in the Navy. So I, when I was working on the boardwalk in New Jersey, I, the suit itched, number one, the wool, the wool Navy uniform. And I went once a week and learned how to tie knots, which was pretty stupid. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, when I, 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 I get, turned in a uniform and thought I wasn't in, in it anymore, so I got drafted in the Army. Well, in the Army, now here I am married. I'm in the Army. 
what do I do now? I tried to get a job in New York and they wouldn't hire me. One of the biggest advertising agencies asked me to uh, offer me a job and I went downstairs to sign up in the uh, personnel office and they said, you're, you're, you're Army B. No, you weren't hired. So I'm in the Army and all my friends are out making $500 a month, you know, uh, from Syracuse. So anyway, and I'm married. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, so, at, uh, what did I do then? <laughs> One moment, Liz. <laughs> I didn't tell you about dancing. Yeah, I know. Well, a little bit. But these are my old tap shoes. And I actually danced till I was 74. Oh, 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 oh. That, that's kind of fun. Anyway. Uh, it's real tap. I'm, I'm not doing it. I can't do it anymore. I broke my hip a couple of years ago, but I'm still good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try it again. Let's see what happens. But anyway, uh, so I get out of Syracuse, I get married, and then uh, I work in, in Florida because I thought that was the mecca for art. Uh, advertising, I studied advertising because my father said, don't do, get into education, right? Came back here, moved back here, and I got a job at uh, uh, Glenrock uh, Elementary School, where I took kindergarten, a junior high, and senior high for seven years, and I loved it. In 1970, I moved up here. Uh, why? Eh, I think it was, I was getting a divorce. Uh, and I had a son at that point, a 10-year-old, and, and, and um, so I moved up here, moved to Brandon. I didn't want to live in Middlebury. I didn't want to live in Rutland. I wanted to move to Brandon. And that, that's another whole story, which I went to. It's not bad. It's, it's good stuff. Um, and at that point, uh, I, 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 I was going to be an artist. I was going to paint. Oh, please. <laughs> you, you, it's, 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 it's a work that way. You have to eat, you know. So anyway, I buy a house in Brandon. By the way, I've lived in 19 houses in Brandon and, and at the lake. I didn't make any money. I went teaching at Castle State College for four thousand dollars a year. The second year, they hired me full time for eight thousand dollars a year. And I left there in nineties in eighty three. They fired me because they didn't have an MFA. I had an equivalency, and they fired me, and they were hiring PhDs to, to uh, really teach these Vermont kids that needed us to stay there and not go for a couple of years and then leave. So anyway, the, the best thing happened to me, so <laughs> don't feel badly for me. But anyway, um, so at that point, I'm in Brandon, and I'm, uh, I'm in Castleton, I leave Castleton. I taught at Green Mountain sometimes. I taught elementary at, uh, oh, up on the mountain, I can't think of the name of it. Um, help. Ripton? Gadcock? No, uh, uh, the, the, it's a private and public school up in Chittenden. Yeah, anyway, that makes any difference. <laughs> anyway, so then, um, so I'm in, um, in uh, Brandon at this point, and that's 1970 when uh, so many of us moved here. They called it a hippie time. I wasn't a hippie, but uh, you know, I thought I was going to be an artist and do art and discovered that I needed a job. So I worked at Castleton for actually seven, uh, seven or eight years and loved every minute of it. I was a good teacher. My classes closed first every, every term because we had fun. You know, it, was, it was a fun class and everybody, strange people took it, <laughs> but, it went, but because they, they learned it. I could still touch students. You know, I could still be over them. I'm not, as I am today, talking to you. I could touch them, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. So what do I do now? So I have been selling antiques since 1962, refinishing furniture and so forth, and a supplementary income. So we go, uh, Lorraine and I, uh, by this time, I'm remarried and got two more kids that Lorraine brought into the marriage, which was wonderful. We go, we've been married 50 years at this point, 49, I guess, 48, I don't know, somewhere around there. <laughs> On seconds, that's not bad. That's great. 
Uh, so, I mean, it takes business, and what do we do? So we travel the country selling folk art, Amer American folk art, which was wonderful. And the best thing I ever did was take kids to Shelburne Museum, uh, 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 student teaching and student teachers, and we take them there, and I was there, I was there all the time. With, with, they would let me in for nothing, actually. They let teachers in for nothing at Shelburne. We're trying to do that here. Bill's not here, is he? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, so, th that all happened. And so here I am in Brandon. Brandon Training School is just going out of business. Uh, they're putting all the, the uh, patients or uh, clients into individual homes and so forth and closing the school. Uh, we had a slum landlord who owned 53 pieces of property in Brandon, some downtown, some out of town. It was not, a, a, with, I loved it. We had good people, but the training school, in a sense, hurt us. If you went to buy a house here and you went to some, um, uh, a realtor in Middlebury, they told you not to move to Brandon. And that's a fact. Uh, that's not happening today, but anyway. <laughs> But, but it, 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 we had a bar that was, you ate the best hamburger in town, mm -hmm. it was at Le Duke's. Right. But at night, you didn't go into Le Duke's because they were going to fight every night. You know? So it was a, a real Vermont, wonderful town at the time, but, but a, little, a little rough around the edges. So, uh, what else was I going to show you? Uh, oh, I forgot to backtrack. I'll get on my pedestal again. <laughs> Um, so, I'm in Brandon and, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, is maybe had 20, 15 people and a buddy of mine and myself uh, decided we would build it up and we built it up to 140 members. Uh, this is all evolving over time. Then I decided uh, that well, I didn't decide, I was walking past the, the 5 and 10 that the slum landlord had just gotten out of and closed. And uh, uh, the bank president was standing in front of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the 5 and 10, and they had just purchased it, the bank had, to protect themselves on the front of the floor. And I, I said to him, what are you going to do with this building? He said, we're going to use it for storage. I said, well, if you're going to use it for storage, could we use the windows to put artwork in? He said, fine. I said, what are you going to do with the back end of it? What are you going to do with the whole story? He said, nothing but storage. I said, could you put the storage in the back? And he said, fine. Uh, well, you want to use it, right? So I said, they charge us $100 a, a, year, a month. And they put, um, and the Chamber of Commerce helped us. Of course, I was a little angle there. And, um, we opened the, the gallery with pegboard all around. All you saw were boom, 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 boom. Holes <laughs> on the for the five and ten. The floor was a mess. The ceiling was a mess. And we opened it and gradually we sunk some money into it. Uh, at that point, excuse me, my back. Um, I don't know what I got under here, but like that's coming up. Uh, oh, by the way, there's, that's not my old microphone, but it works in case you hear this. Uh, so, uh, we opened the Brandon Artist Guild. And I went to Dottie, fine here, lived on Park Street, good old friend. And I said to her, we are going to, uh, we're going to paint pigs. And I don't remember what she said, but I think she saw we were nuts. But anyway, some people thought we were painting real big. So I explained to her what we were going to do. And I said, Dottie, I'm asking everybody for $500. Now that's a lot of money in a small town to ask the people for. Mm -hmm. In two weeks, I collected $20,000 to buy 40 pigs. Wow. And I think you were the first one I asked. Actually, uh, that's amazing. Could we do that today? I'm not so sure, but anyway, so we did that. Uh, we collected, uh, as I say, and, and 
Then what, then what do you do with them? Then we asked 40 artists to paint them. And we had to ask 40 good artists, because these were this big. And as Lorraine said to me, now that you've paid for the pigs, because the pigs were like $600 a piece, a fiberglass pig. Now what do you, now what do you use for advertising? I don't know, we'll win it, we'll make it, we'll make it work. And, and we did. So we had them painted. Uh, great fun with it because when they arrived we had big pictures taken and with, with the unpainted pigs and so forth. And then, then we decided that we would have some fun with it. So we had them painted, we put them all out on the street because the object was to stop people in, to come and make them come to Brandon. And you know, people go through Brandon, unlike here, you don't. You go through on that end, but you you have stores. Our store. It's it's a highway goes through. How do we stop people? We stop them with all these forty pigs outside the stores and everything all all year, up, up, all summer. I remember once one was missing from Leduc. Leduc, somebody <laughs> the bar and pulled it down the street, right? and I was like, oh great, it's gone. <laughs> Because that's what that'd be best publicity you could do. Yes. You know, say the pigs were stolen. Right? <laughs> anyway, so we, uh, I have the brochure in the back there. Would you bring that up, Mary? I mean, we really, no, not that one, the pig. Yes. Yeah, that one. So we really did this right. This is the brochure. I mean, we spent money to make money. So this is the brochure of the the different pigs and the artists about the artists and so forth and the pictures we had a parade, a pig parade in the rain, it still worked. <laughs> then we decided we were going to have an auction. So we rented a tent in back of the <coughs> We dressed in formal clothing, uh, tuxedos and, and uh, um, evening gowns and women had on. We marched, we had a big round thing to put the pigs up on. It was like a suspect auction, perhaps. And we put the pigs up on the pedestal, rolled them up the aisle to music. I mean, it was, it was just too much. Anyway, that night we raised $160,000 wow. on the pig. You can't do it today. It, it wouldn't work today. It was new and different. We were the first small town in Vermont to, uh, to do one of, one of those uh, figures. Uh, uh, Saratoga had done horses, and New York had done uh, cows or bulls or something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, New Orleans did fish. Who? New Orleans did fish. Yeah, and everybody, everybody had done it, but no small town had done it. And that was our claim to fame. So, uh, that, that, and with that, <coughs> we brought the, uh, the, all of the, um, the building that the Brandon Artist Guild is in, we bought it, we refurbished it, and today we have a lot of money, probably more than any other artist guild in, 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 in the state, as a backlog because of that. Uh, we did all the renovations and did all this stuff, so that's, that's up here. And then we went on to do bird houses, we called that Brandon's for the birds. You have, to, you have to have fun with this. You have to talk about who you are and what you are. So we were for the bird. There, were, there weren't bird houses that any bird would ever go in. They were, some of them were this big. I did one of an arc that was huge. And they did well. Now the artists are getting tired. We start doing, we do boxes. Brandon's thinking out of the box. We did, uh, what else did we do here? We did rocking chairs. Uh, we did cats, Brandon's raining cats and dogs. Uh, the pig show is called the Really Really Pig Show. Like the, uh, what's his name? It's, what's his name? Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan, right. Um, and then we did clocks. And this year we did quilt squares. We. All these auctions went from $160,000 to maybe 50 down to 10. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, once it's been done, it's been done. 
It's the same with everything. You pray, it's everything. You gotta think of something new all the time, and it's darn near impossible. But we keep trying. So what we're gonna do, I think next year we're doing gourds. Everybody in town is gonna raise gourds and we're gonna paint them in with them. It's not the cleverest thing I ever heard of, but it, but it brings the community together. And then with the Vermont Arts Council, uh, I was on a asked to be on the Vermont Arts Council many years ago. And I was upset because the Arts Council was in Montpelier. And they didn't really didn't do anything for the state. They just gave $500 or three, uh, under $500 to an artist each year. $500 doesn't do anything for anybody anymore. I mean, that, that's a joke. And they, they catered to the uh, uh, theater stuff, which is wonderful, don't get me wrong, that was really wonderful. And so uh, Alex Aldridge was the president then of, of the board, and I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be on it. Uh, you don't, you, I, I've been here 30 some years, and I don't know anything about you. You paid no attention to the artists around the state. So he brought the president of the board down to the, to the uh, restaurant, our, our great restaurant, um, at the cafe, and we sat there, and he said, well, what can we do to get you to, to stay on the board? I said, I don't know, but I said, I can't think of what you could do. I said, you don't service the state of Vermont. You're in Montpelier, and you raise money, and that's fine with the legislature and so forth, but we need to do something to bring this state together or what. So I don't know where this came from, believe me, but I said, let's paint pallets. So, uh, they said, okay, you do it then, you know, yeah. you, you name it, you do it, you know. So anyway, uh, we have got a, a wood company to make hundreds and thousands of pallets that we gave to all the school children. We actually gave them paper ones, I'm going to be wrong. We, each community, the, the object was it to raise a, awareness of the arts that everybody was an artist, not just me or Safer or those people that everybody knew, but to, to raise the awareness that everybody had a creative spirit, and also to create uh, uh, something in the community like the pigs, and they were did it themselves. They they uh, raised their own money. They decided whether they were going to have an auction. They decided whether they were just going to put them up. They were going to give them away. They were going to everything. And so every community in Vermont got these wooden pallets. And everybody did it. It was so successful, it was unbelievable. They're still talking about it in the legislature. And it wasn't the money, it was just the awareness of, of, of having a community bring itself together. And some communities joined together, I think, a couple over the mountain, I remember that. Wonderful, wonderful stories about this uh, silly palace. Uh, we did great work. We don't get too big remember, right? But we did great work. Uh, so it was just, in fact, we're going to do them next year again. Somebody just came up with an idea of doing some more in Brandon to, to our roads are awful, you know. <laughs> Take the back road. <laughs> anyway, but we, and, and that brings up another thing, uh, community. <coughs> Here we are, we're, they're spending millions of dollars in Brandon, and some of it's already done and it's gorgeous. We are going to be unbelievably beautiful when this is done. It's already started up the upper part. But you can't get through us because they've dug every hole there is to dig and dug it again and again and again. So, and that's good too because our infrastructure is all brand new now. It's not hundreds of years old, it's all brand new. So, I said, well, what are we going to do to make uh, the uh, it aware? And even better brand than I made up, and we love our mess. <laughs> we do. We love our mess. Because in another year, you aren't going to recognize us. And so I sold, or we sold, I should say, 125 hats. <laughs> and we have a number in them. And every month, we draw a, uh, a number, and that person gets $50 worth of merchandise. Bring people into town to spend the money in the merchandise in town. At the end of this uh, whole thing, we're going to um, give away, uh, I think, $2,500 to somebody 
and I'm going, you're not going to give it to somebody, uh, you get a ticket in the, in the stores or something, somebody from New Jersey is going to come in and get $2,500. They said, yes, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. I want to give it to somebody in town, but it's going to be somebody from foreign places, I think, but anyway. So, this was fun. We had a, a, a day to introduce all of this. You've seen the thing that goes into town, this funny animal that's made out of cones. Don't ask me what that animal is. We design those. Um, we have a house that's painted that says, better for who? You know, there's always, always people don't get it. Or, you know, anyway. So, but that's okay too. All publicity is good. Um, what have I got here? Oh, that's Syracuse stuff. Anyway, so that's how you uh, get community together. How do, how do you make it work for you? How do you make ad adversity work? Uh, we were having trouble because some of you were going through town and it took you 20 minutes to get through because you're waiting there in line in the hot summer, right? So I said, well, what do people need when they're going through town? They need water. So we dressed the guy up in an orange top. Everything is orange and it, it, it had nothing to do with syrup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, anyway, and that's my favorite color anyway. All these things are orange, see, so I had a dry green shoe. So I, I dressed up a guy in a, an orange top, plastic uh, suit in the middle of summer, which is pretty crazy. And we, as the people were going through town, we're going to do it again. I bought little bottles of water that said "Welcome to Brandon" and so forth. So we walked up to them at their at the, their their cars and handed them a bottle of water. What did that do? It made people smile. It's happy. Yeah. It's fun. And we can't do it all day and all night because our businesses are hurting, and it can't be helped. It, it, all of them are down 25 percent or more, and that's a lot in this small town. But they haven't left. And we have a, a brewery just came in. We have a whiskey place coming in. I'm opening up a new gallery, which is absolutely stupid at this age, but, but I'm doing it uh, with two other uh, folk artists right next to Brandon Inn. And, and that's what you do. You keep it going. Nobody's left. Uh, the advantage that we have is that we don't have a college and we don't have a ski run. So we have to service the whole community, every level of, of, of people. The, um, and, and the other thing is, I was talking to uh, Paul Brun of the uh, Vermont Historic Trust, is that what's called? Historic Preservation. Right? The other week I gave a talk to them. And I said, and Paul said, you hit, it up, hit the nail on the head. We have spokes in town. You can walk into that town, in this town, in that town, and have everything you need. Grocery store, dentist, doctors, vet, uh, dress shop. The dress shop's going crazy in Brandon. It didn't do that well here. I don't know. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, just craziness. So we haven't lost our business. We lost a couple. We also have a tattoo parlor, which I don't quite understand. <laughs> So that's the kind of thing that's, that's happening there. The, the trick is getting people together. Uh, one thing that I, I, I maybe this this is important. We have a golf course, but we don't have enough doctors to play with doctors. We don't have enough lawyers to play with lawyers. So the doctors and the lawyers have to play with the school teachers and the plumbers and the electricians, which doesn't always happen in a community. So that that's another melting thing. We have a lot of empty churches. But nobody cares about churches in Brandon. Oh, there's a Congo church and we go there for different things and different people from different religions go to that for, for different things there. But we don't talk about religion. Uh, very interesting to me that, that uh, it's not the focus and doesn't create pockets. Um, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, but, 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 but to me, it works and, and makes things work better. Yeah, I socialize with the plumber, but I sure work with the plumber a lot after yeah, doing so many houses. <laughs> he knows me and he's very happy about me. <laughs> anyway, so 
that's all good stuff. Uh, I don't know whether I, um, I... I just want to say that art has... Um, art has made my life. I'm a happy, I'm, I'm a happy guy. I've had some bumps. Uh, lost a child to AIDS in, in the 90s and so forth. And parent died and all that kind of stuff. But you, you've all had those things too. But the art has kept me vital. And it's kept me, somebody said, you said there's no retire. I, I don't have anything to retire from. I probably would have retired from teaching. That probably would have happened. But I don't have anything to retire from because I'm still doing it. I just came back from the Vermont Studio Center where I've been for 14 times. The Vermont Studio Center is in Johnson, Vermont. There are 50, 50 artists and writing, writers there from all over the country and all over the world. Every, uh, every month. Not many people know about it. It's a ret I call it a retreat. My wife calls it art camp. <laughs> so I've been there. They have an art uh, a Vermont week for art artists from Vermont. It's very inexpensive and very available to artists that uh, are here and we get to know each other. Uh, I have uh, I've been there for a month. I've been there for two weeks. I've been there 14 times. I just went a week and a half ago. Now, what do I do there? You know, I, I, I'm known for folk art. I do all the other stuff. Nobody <laughs> knows about it. I care about it, have fun with it. Um, so I go there, and every time I go there, a new body of work happens. The Widows of War happened there. I don't know whether any of you saw that at Shelburne. Uh, that's been in New York, all kinds of places. And, and anyway, and I still have it. I haven't sold any of it. If anybody knows any college or university that wants it, I'd be glad to give it to them. But it's hard to give to universities and colleges today because they don't have the money to support it, to, to, to take care of it. I totally understand that. Um, and it was to, to Shelburne for a, a little whole thing. That I have lots of retrospectives. <laughs> I had a wonderful one here. You know, here, I, I don't think I have any more. Anyway. <laughs> So this is what I did there. I did this, and I did a, a political piece, and this is sort of, I didn't bring it because I didn't want to insult anybody or anything, but it, it, it came out of me with the politics of today. And this is sort of about gun control. I don't really know what it's about, but that, that's where that came from. And then I tried to do a new piece of folk art while I was there. You know, how do, how do I re invigorate, or how do I rejuvenate the folk art that, that I've done it all over and over and over again. So I did this piece, and it's a little different, a little bit, not big time, but it, 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 I got something else out of it. And to me, it looks like a coloring book. Maybe that goes back to my coloring book days. And then I just went into the art store up there, and I bought this damn big canvas. <laughs> <laughs> And there's another painting under this. So I, not, not finished, but you know, under it. So this is what I'm working on now. And it relates to this, in a sense. So everything I do, I also did a thing about bits and pieces, because of being in the antique business, having all these pieces in there. And there's a booklet back there. I had a, a show with Brock Hall year ago, I guess. And uh, in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> I still up for that, right? Uh, but so I have all that, I have a lot of storage, my poor kids. Oh, <laughs> anyway, so that's, this is the latest. I, this is, I'm still working on this. And I have, this is how I work on it. These are the shingles that I kind of worn off in the car. But, <laughs> but that's how I work on it. I, I draw on it with chalk and then paint over it, especially on a canvas like this. I probably won't do too much canvas because I like working on it the hard boards more than I do the canvas, but people like canvas, you know, people like oil painting, mine are all acrylic, sorry about that, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and they look like oil, everything I painting is oil because when I finish it does have an oil appearance, so that's quite fun. So that's a story of, of my life and what I did and what I'm doing and I'm still doing and I'm still happy and still Happy living, doing fun things, and enjoying it. So, anybody had any questions? Don't be afraid to ask me any silly questions. Any questions? Yeah. Well, 
I have a question about uh, artist legacy stuff. You know, we've got uh, it's such a big issue nationally. Mm -hmm. um, how are you dealing with it? You I'm know? not. You're not. Uh, <laughs> the, kids, you, the kids keep saying, "What do you want?" And over Christmas, they wanted me to write my obituary. I mean, I just wanted to go a little bit too far. But they said, oh, when you died, you know, we don't know everything. Like I said in the beginning about my parents, I, I don't even know when they were born and so forth. Uh, they do, do know, and they've been a part of all this. But it's like the shoemakers. It's difficult. You no, know, oh, it's a huge field so, across the country. It's so what difficult. do you do? What, what art isn't selling like it used to. Uh, young people are not buying art. They're buying art. They're buying canvases that are stretched Video. photographs. Mm -hmm. And they're buying smaller houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the high end of art and the high end of antiques will never die. That's going fine. And it will always go fine. But it's, it's, it's the, the, the us guys and the, and, the, and the Sunday painter and the wonderful things that you see in the galleries and so forth. And, and, oh yeah, they sell once in a while, not, not, not putting it down, but they're not selling like they did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. The young people, they, they just don't care. They care about electronics, mm -hmm. skiing, their families, more so, you know? They, they, so what do you do with all this? Like my daughter walking in and saying, oh. <laughs> And my wife keeps saying, don't worry about it, you won't be here to worry about it. <laughs> no. but, and like me saying, and my son-in-law said, and uh, my son, uh, what, what is your legacy? What do you want? I, 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 you know, I have, I have it here, it's right here. This is my legacy. Um, if you remember it, fine. Uh, but you're not gonna be around forever either, so. Uh, you know, I, I've sold, I think, um, I, I didn't talk about my licensing thing, and the licensing thing is when they put my artwork on everything but toilet paper. <laughs> everything. I mean, I'm on everything. And it sold in the 90s for 20 years. That is unheard of for an artist. It was pure luck. I didn't, I didn't solicit it. It happened, but I worked hard at it to make it continue, which a lot of artists don't. They want to do five paintings and, you know, I really worked hard on it. Um, and to support other people, too. That's the other thing. But that legacy will come back. That whole folk art will come back. It's dead now. You know, I don't have licenses like that. I have 50 licenses and whatnot. I have sold, this is not counting uh, what's on it, on the mugs and all that kind of stuff. They have actually sold over 8 million prints of mine. I would love to have had 50 cents a piece for it. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done with it, or if I'm happy enough as I am, I don't really need it. But, but what is a legacy? What, what are 200 paintings sitting in my garage? What is going to happen to them? Everybody say, oh, well, after you get there, they'll be worth more. No, not necessarily. In the future, they may be, maybe, maybe, lots of maybes. But there's no guarantee of that. Does that help? I, I can't answer that. No, 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 because it's an open-ended question in many ways. I'm happy to, you know, we carry on talking about it. It's a problem, and different artists deal with it in different ways. That's why I was asking what you were, you know. But isn't it true that today... A lot of them start foundations, and some of them, like, allow for... Yeah. That costs and, a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, and they're, they endow the, you know, they, they mm -hmm. create an endowment, but there is... Uh, what they what's referred to as a sunset clause or you know like a burn rate where the work is meant to be placed in museums and that's what what the staffing is about it's about them placing it in places that will then carry on you well, know and carry on the legacy i think one of the disappointments i never said this before it's, I, it's I, open whether I should say it but anyway i'm going to say it when I had the exhibit at Shelburne, right, I brought in a lot of people from around the country and around the world to see what, I, what was there. It was a wonderful experience for me. I, I, I cherish it and it, it was fabulous. I could be at Shelburne Museum today 
if I had $350,000 to endow a, 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 a room or a building. Very interesting. And that would have been a legacy. But they have to maintain it. They have to have to find a place for it. And so if you have that kind of money to do it, and I know somebody that did it there, I would be there and have a permanent exhibit there. They don't have anything in mind. It's just interesting. The old guy left. Sorry. And uh, they need to Stephen Yost left. If he had stayed there, something would have happened. But new people come in. And uh, 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 Mrs. Webb, that's what she wanted. She wanted new artwork. She wanted what was going on at the time and to continue it. It's, it's not happening, but maybe that's another whole story. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. So um, you have these exhibits and you have the pigs being painted and you raise all this money. So um, there are 40 artists that donate their time and you... Yes. So then how is the community involved? Where did that money go? Where did the investment go? Why did you do the pigs? Oh, okay. I should have mentioned that. We have eight schools in town. Elementary to high school, junior high and so forth. And we gave hundreds and hundreds of dollars for art supplies for those schools. Not to the teacher, not to the school, but we actually made them buy the art supply because otherwise, I'm, I'm having taught, I know that budgets just get, you know, to other things and everything. So that's what we did. We're still doing that. We give a scholarship to the high school every year. And we do buy the art supplies when we do these projects, big time. To eight schools, yeah, I think he's eight schools, I don't remember the amount they got, but they, they all got a couple thousand dollars piece. So, so, so is there somebody who manages this money? Is there, no, is there an investment of this money? No, There's no endowment that's no. established? We don't have a, an executive director at the uh, Brandon Artist Guild. We run it all ourselves. We maintain it. We sit. Oh, some of us do, and most of us do. <laughs> I don't. But anyway, I can't run a cash register on the very day. But, but um, what's a cash register? That's a past thing, right? Uh, but, but that, um, yeah, no, we give big, big time back to the community. And, and, and we bought the curtain for the uh, town hall uh, theater, our town hall theater. We bought lighting for the town hall. So, so all the this arts. money goes to, to all the other things that, that, are, that are related in a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Yes. Yeah, Warren, did you, didn't you say that you know, that large amount of money that you made initially, is that what helped you buy the building? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That helped buy the building and, and refurbish the whole building and still helps to maintain the building. We don't sell a lot of art. Our I mean, we sell, it's okay, we, you know, but, but art isn't selling like it was. Um, Warren, something that I really admire about you and, and always have is that every year you find a new way to tell a new story and that your art continues to change. I like to find new ways to tell a new story in my life. How do you find new art every year? I know that you go up on a retreat every year yeah, and recharge, but how <coughs> do you encourage someone else to find the new story within them? Uh, that, that's interesting and, and, and something I really feel very deeply about. Most artists get stuck in something. And they, they do what they do and they do it well. But they don't play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, college does that to you. Because you see other things going on when you're that age. Different kinds of things. Now it doesn't always work. But it makes you um, adventuresome. Um, it makes you want to, uh, you, I, I preach this to artists all the time. You can't, you can't do the same old frames all the time. You can't do the same old sizes all the time. 
You've got to, you've got to play. And Johnson is playing. Home is not, is, is harder to play. Uh, I'm lucky I don't have another job. Most women, are, uh, women artists, and I, I do a whole thing for women, to uh, women artists, that women artists have five jobs. They, they, get, if they get married, I especially say this, if, once you've just gotten out of an MFA program or a college program, they, they get out and they have to get a job, number one. And, they, and then they get, maybe have a partner or a marriage or something. Then they have kids, then they have dogs, then they have a house, and then they cook. I don't know how women do all this stuff. But anyway, then they work on the dining room table, which gets cleaned off three times a day. The guy's out to work. Yeah, no, he's doing fine, and he's maybe supporting, or anyway, whatever he's doing. But he's working. It's not that he's not doing anything. But he comes home and has a photography studio, or has a woodworking thing in the garage, and he gets to go do it while she's still cooking, taking care of the baby, and doing all of those five things and not doing any artwork because she can't get off the dining room table. Now, what were we talking about? We were talking about fostering creativity. So, so how do you do that? First of all, I, I, I tell them work small. Of course, you can always put the small things together and make one big one. <laughs> and people don't think of that. Mm -hmm. uh, join an art guild or, or, or go see artwork. That's not easy to do in those formative years. And when they get older, they haven't done it. They haven't done it in years. I had a couple people come up to me recently and say, we are now doing our work. The, the cheerleader coach at Syracuse visited me last week and she works and does that and everything else. And she's a, a, a graduate painter. I said, do you have a studio? She said, no, but the kids are all out. I said, what about those empty rooms? She went home and she now has a studio, not fancy, but in an empty room. But you have to be told, you have to, you have to hear it. Because it's too easy, life takes over. And the creativity stops if you don't do it. So I, I don't know what the answer to that is except listening to some old guy bitch about it. You know, and, and, and tell you, get the studio, you know. He gets it, you get it. You have to you have to do it, but it's too easy not to. So you lose it if you don't use it. Yeah. Yeah. Warren, I would just like to um, comment on you continuing to be a cheerleader for the arts um, in terms of the energy that you put forward. And because I've been in this community for 36 years and brought my students here because of the um, wonderful historical putting kids into a building with dull old rooms, but still so that they could learn. I do want to comment about how the museum, in my perspective through this 36 years, has been really putting art back into this museum. Yeah. And I, You're I, right. I, I was sure that you would agree with You're me. Let me right. be on my little soapbox <laughs> for a moment. Yeah. But. Uh, and and you're right. they, they gave me a wonderful show. They had the show with, I can't think of her, Kennedy with the, the, the dresses that made out of... Wendy Cock. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, the, the bicycles. Exactly. You know? yeah. But those things uh, are important because they bring in all levels to this place. What you are doing, what I think was part of the theme of what you've been saying today, which is working to build community. Yes. And that's exactly what your hard hat and yeah. it has our best keep loving us. It's, it's, yeah. not, uh, it's not exclusive and it's not fussy. The woman who makes doilies at home to me is an artist. A lot of people don't think that way. But uh, I was going to do a bit by saying, uh, I'm just going to take you all outside and say, where is their art? And it's everywhere. It's the clothes. I mean, everybody's got different art on them. Every, everything that we wear is, has a design on it that some artists did. It's not a painting, but it could be, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, the chair is designed. The building is not this building, but new buildings are designed. or water. The tables, the chairs, the food that we eat is designed. Those who make it, design it every 
Nine for every lunch. They, my wife will not put anything on a plate unless it has color. <laughs> you know, nothing gets on its all white, you know. So it, we're all artists in a sense, but we don't think that way. We think paintings. Uh, everything in here, the lighting, somebody had to design that. Everything around us, everything we touch constantly every day is art. And some politicians don't understand that either, but anyway, that's another whole discussion. Anyway, this just went on forever. <laughs> 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 <laughs>